Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome from GSG Impact Summit in the beautiful Buenos Aires in Argentina. My name is Unmer Shet and I'm a founder and CEO of SOPAC, a mission-driven company to make impact measurement and management simple. Our mission is to scale the social businesses and nonprofits and make continuous learning and improvement. So All About Outcome is a new webinar series to generate dialogue between the leaders and change makers for the respective fields. Together, we intend to learn about challenges, solutions, and the risk of sustainable development goals in, uh, in different team, impact team areas. All About Outcome is a series, and so with the regular webinar series, and our next webinar series is gonna be in next December 17. Topic would be get ready for 2020, act actionable steps, to IDIS Plus Impact Management Project and SDG Impact Certification. I'm so excited and happy to see the, uh, the, uh, the huge interest in this webinar today. Is it because there's a huge interest in SRY or you just want to find out about that? Is it about your interest in learning about convergence in standards? Or is it about scaling the social business is your interest altogether? Whatever those uh, interest is, essentially, hopefully you will find this webinar to be useful. So, few housekeeping items. This program is live webinar, and q and is accessible from web-enabled computer or mobile device. If you have a technical challenge, please use the chat window, and please use q and uh, because I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions. Not only that, um, when you have questions, please do up upvote so that we can take the higher vote uh, questions ahead of uh, in the queue altogether. I request you to add uh, as many questions as possible and we'll, I promise you that we're gonna have enough time to have a larger conversations with some of the leader in the space. So this is your opportunity to ask them directly your questions about the space and how things are emerging altogether. So please do not hesitate. Do upvote so that we know which to take it altogether. We will be recording this webinar and share it on the YouTube channel so that you can uh, and you can please subscribe to the channel. I'll sh later sh share the channel with you as well. We are so privileged to have a two well-known leader in experienced impact practitioners as our guest. Many of you already know Ben Carpenter, CEO of SOPAC, uh, Social Value UK and Social Value International, and Timothy Lam Lambert, who is an associate impact VC. Uh, of the SI2 funds in Belgium. He's not only running the, the active fund, but he has a very innovative way of essentially thinking about how social impact ecosystem can be scaled. And he's very passionate about helping social entrepreneurs. And he, in fact, he is in Guatemala as we speak. Uh, so uh, he's helping many, many social entrepreneurs scale their mission altogether. SI2 is an impact first in investment fund with European scope and scaling and innovative this, uh, social businesses with funding, access to market and expertise. This fund strives for, well, uh, for, the, for a world where both entrepreneurs and investors can engage in ex addressing the most pressing societal problems of our time. Social Value International, on the other hand, is a network of networks united by a shared mission to change the way the world accounts for the value with members in over 45 countries representing a range of disciplines in public, private, civil society sectors, SVI is changing the way society accounts for the value. So the topic today is scaling the social business with impact measurement and management. Um, today, you will learn about some historical perspective of trends uh, on social valuation and monetization practical use case um, that you will learn from as SI2 uh, that define the overall value uh, and detailed walkthrough of use cases on how social business is using uh, SROI and IMM based practices in uh, uh, social business and trends. Uh, we'll learn a bit more about from Ben and uh, uh, Timothy about impact management projects, how Global value uh, innovation uh, 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 international is aligning around SI impact management project in addition to uh, their uh, core SROI practices. So without delay, uh, let, let me invite uh, our guest 
Ben Carpenter from UK and Timothy, who is on the mission to mentor hundreds of social entrepreneurs in Latin America. Uh, um, and so uh, we really want to uh, uh, give an opportunity for Ben and Tim to say quickly hi to the audience. Uh, ben and Tim, could you um, say hi to everyone? Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> hi, everyone. Thank you, Amesh. Uh, thank you, Amesh, Etal, and everyone at SOPAC for the opportunity to join this conversation today. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I would like to thank SOPACT for uh, organizing a webinar on such an important topic, I think very critical for the future of the impact investing in social entrepreneurship sector. Um, I saw it's um, quite a diverse audience today, so I apologize in advance for any point or claim that might not be relevant or applicable to each and everyone's specific situation. But I do sincerely welcome any critical feedback, any question at the end of the session. Yeah. Excellent. With that uh, quick introduction to you all, um, again, um, I, it's my pleasure to uh, first invite, uh, this is going to be very informal and very uh, hopefully uh, collaborative session. And hopefully this is going to be an, uh, your opportunity to ask a lot of questions about this reason why you have joined this call today. Uh, so Ben, uh, with that in a quick introduction out, um, um, I want to really invite you to uh, maybe give us a huge perspective because you, uh, SROI was really founding uh, element of impact, now we call impact measurement and management. Uh, and so there's a whole things that have changed and evolved over the period of time. Um, for those of uh, us, and many of them are not familiar, and let, let, before we go, let, let us share some insights that we received from some of you. So uh, maybe Hetal, if you can share the screen. Um, and Hethel, I'm not seeing the screen. Hey, there you go. And uh, so this, this is what we learned today uh, from all of you. And so we want to transparently share um, how, how, how everybody thinks about this uh, space, essentially. So first question we asked is, that, are you using SROI in impact assessment today? And 10% said yes. And that sounds like that a lot of people are still on, on the fence, but they are very interested in figuring out how to use it all together. And so um, between uh, yes and partially, it's about uh, 40%, that's not too bad. 62% um, are still trying to figure out what that means. And so I think you will have ample opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about that. Obviously this is not a uh, le lesson on SROI. There are many other avenues for doing that altogether. Okay, next question is about uh, why do you want to have an impact evidence? And I'll, I'll give a little bit of perspective here. So I'm here in a uh, beautiful Argentina here, and uh, I, I was surrounded by uh, amazing global investors uh, throughout the world. This is really, if you're not familiar with GSG, is the Global Impact Investors um, uh, Conference from all over the world. Many of them are represented in uh, underdeveloped countries like uh, some in Latin America, Africa, India. And one of the interesting elements that I saw obviously is that there's a huge pent up uh, uh, the demand and need and growth uh, from impact uh, uh, investment. Now with impact investment, there's a very large call for action that in order to impact investment to grow and scale, impact evidence is the core of the whole entire thing. In fact, without impact evidence, the impact management space cannot grow. So if people who have been doing impact washing or SDG washing or green washing, I think that their time are over and it's time to now uh, start really clearly communicate, have a right strategy in place so that you can start gathering impact evidence. So um, with that uh, background in mind, I, I want to really um, share with you some of the results. So 25% uh, of the is a good to have. Um, and uh, uh, the 20% say the funders are asking for it. And uh, the, uh, then 12% say need to have raised more capital altogether. And I'm so glad to see the largest percentages with the we owe it to the stakeholders because fundamental impact evidence is all about uh, really creating impact for the stakeholders. So I'm very excited that all of you agree with that sent uh, sentiment. And finally, what is your impact management process looks like? We asked the question, how do you, you do it today? 
10% uh, of you are using IDs based approach. Wow, 17% so are using SRI. Ben, you must be thinking happy about that. <laughs> um, and then impact management project, I'm glad Impact management project, by the way, is only two years old. And I can tell you from me going from uh, Gene Conference to SOCAP to GSG here, there's an amazing amount of convergence and so much pent up alignment around impact management projects. So if you're not paying attention to impact management project, you should. And in fact, you could come to next webinar for that as well. So very interesting, uh, very, very uh, powerful way of essentially aligning your impact. Um, to, to IMM based approach. Um, and at the end of the day, all those things are around aligning sustainable development goal. Obviously, um, we did add some SDG as part of the one of the topic, but essentially, fundamentally, it's about um, as different um, investors and, and enterprise works, alignment is very critical. And critical element of alignment really typically comes from SDG based approach altogether. And so that is the core uh, summary of what we learned from you all. And uh, we just wanted to share with you. With that, I would like to invite uh, Ben uh, Carpenter from uh, uh, CEO of, of Social Value International to give us a historical perspective of Social uh, Value International, where it has started and where we are and where we are, where we are going. So Ben, please, uh, without any delay, you can take it on. And Hithil can share a couple of initial slides that you have uh, prepared. Thank you, Amash. Um, okay, Hetel, if you can load up the slides, that might be helpful. I think the first slide is really to um, remind everyone of our mission. As uh, Amash mentioned, uh, we're uh, our, our mission is to change the way the world accounts for value. So we believe that value has been too long focused on cost and price, and that, that value needs to broaden its definition to include social and environmental. And we are a, a, a movement uh, of, of networks around the world who are uh, bringing practitioners together to develop what that looks like because we're entering a new age where value is seen in different ways and, and we don't know how to do that yet. And we think the best way to develop these standards is collaboratively, drawing on the skills and um, experience of professionals from a range of disciplines. So our networks, as Amesh said, is a, a very diverse, it's got people from all around the world coming at it from different sectors and different perspectives. Accountancy, um, evaluation, uh, sustainability reporting, these are all disciplines that have contributed to the emergence of um, the standards that Social Value International developed. I still can't see the slide, so I'm just going to carry on talking. I might, I might be going off uh, um, message, but um, in terms of the, the way of accounting for value, um, we our approach is really around a set of principles. It's the seven principles of social value that we uh, advocate for. So when uh, creating an account of value, it's, it's a principles based approach. So we're looking to standardize the approach, uh, whether these principles have been applied. And these seven principles, um, once applied, will allow you to create a complete account of the impact or the value that you're creating. That's what the, the framework is designed to do. And when I say complete account, it means capturing all of the uh, impacts, whether those are positive or negative, whether those are intended or unintended. Um, and that creates that accountability. So it, it, it is different to other forms of evaluation in, in that it is deliberately there to create a complete account of all material impacts for stakeholders. And of course, one of the principles is value what matters. And that is principle number three, if I remember correctly. Uh, and um, value what matters when applied, you can use monetization to apply that principle. So you are looking at the um, impacts and using money to represent the relative importance. That is not the only way to apply the principle. And we are very keen to stress that if you don't want to use monetization, you can use uh, weightings or ranking to express that relative importance of impact. Ultimately, that principle is designed to help an enterprise understand which impacts or which outcomes are most important from the perspective of those stakeholder groups. This information is very important because it allows better decision making in terms of driving improvements of the impact that are most important to stakeholders. When uh, 
principle number three does use monetization to express that relative importance, we call this social return on investment. So going back to the title of this webinar, social return on investment is a, is a framework of principles which uses monetization to express the relative importance of these different impacts. Um, yeah, so, so that's the origins of the social value principles, who we are as a network, and uh, what, what, it, what it aims to do, which is that create that accountability framework in terms of reporting a complete account of material impacts. Is that enough for now, Amesh? Sorry, you're on mute. Uh, sorry. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great introduction about SRI, and it gives a good perspective and um, history on the um, um, uh, SRI. Um, I before we go to uh, Timothy, I also want to make sure if, if you can give uh, audience a little bit of uh, the color and perspective about how this field has evolved uh, from. Um, what obviously Timothy is going to be talking more about from impact funds perspective, basically how they make the, uh, the decision to scale their social businesses, uh, which is one of the unique um, use case of SROI. But I would also like you to share some more examples of how historically been used in a, other sectors like nonprofits and other philanthropic and uh, foundation aspects. So, uh, can you give a little bit more color to that? And basically also, where are we going? Uh, also, and we can talk about where are we going last, essentially, so we can keep to the, the future past less. But I think I, I'm okay. very, I want to color, color, the, connect the dots here uh, uh, from the principles to how people have been using so far. And really, uh, and if you see any particular additional use cases, um, uh, would definitely like to, uh, audience like to know that. Yeah, okay. Um, so in terms of um, use cases, uh, the principles of social value are being used uh, by a range of different organizations. Um, a lot of uh, social purpose organizations are using them as a, a framework to um, do their impact measurement and management. It, it allows them to apply principles in a way that is appropriate for their context. Um, it's not standardized metrics, but um, these principles can be applied um, gradually and in proportionate to the resources. Um, I believe that, um, and Timothy will, will, I'm sure, elaborate on this, some investors and funders are looking at the social value principles and framework of SRI as a, a kind of a, a way of checking whether their investments are complying with a standard, an international standard that is being uh, developed as we speak. Um, and how does that relate to uh, other initiatives? Well, ever since we were set up uh, 12 years ago, we've, we've constantly been working with other frameworks that are, exist out there to, to draw similarities between the, the set of principles that we've created as a framework and, and how they relate to other initiatives, whether that's GRI, uh, IRIS, um, or in more recent years, the Impact Management Project. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Umesh, um, it is really encouraging to notice that um, lately, certainly in the last couple of years, we're seeing huge convergence uh, and consistency in thought um, about the principles and uh, the particular data points that need to be collected. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to know that um, around the world, uh, whether you're, you're looking at the Impact Management Project um, or GRI, we are talking about principles of involving stakeholders, uh, materiality, um, assurance and verification. So if, with a look to the future, I see that um, uh, there is slowly a global consensus on, in theory, how we account for value. Um, whether that works in practice is a different matter, and I'm sure we will come on to that. Um, but it's, it's exciting times, and I see these principles being adopted uh, by enterprises and investors um, increasingly in, in the years ahead. Great. Um, so, um, uh, with that, some practical issues. And by the way, I can I can tell you uh, again, sitting here in a GSG, um, uh, the pool of there was a there was a session led by Clara Barbie and more than hundred practitioners from mostly asset managers, sitting in there and talking about some of the highly 
uh, very difficult questions uh, about uh, why we should do a measurement in first place and uh, how we should do it and ultimately what is the real purpose, which is really a compare the results essentially. Um, now, these are the very challenging questions at the time. At the same time is that I can tell you one thing sitting over here is that the, uh, the investor community is quite familiar with some of the challenges, obviously, of measuring all those different uh, things. And th these issues are not simple. And that's why we have uh, impact practitioners helping to uh, the, uh, the unscramble all the different uh, the jargons and challenges of uh, uh, creating the, the, uh, the partnerships. Um, but I think that there's a lot of will that I see in the, this community to solve this issue of um, the why measurement and why uh, do the valuation, uh, uh, why, why essentially, uh, and there are different approaches obviously from scorecard to um, the, the ratings to uh, the SROI based approach altogether. And they, they all can have be used in different contexts altogether. So with that, maybe a couple of other questions I have, uh, and this is something very, I'm sure that a lot of uh, audience may have in mind is that what are the challenges, um, of at least one challenge that I see from the, the tool provider perspective is really about um, before you even go to the SROI, you have to have very well defined theory of change and metrics and data per se. And other challenge we obviously see about financial proxy. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the people, so we really don't really raise the expectation, make sure we give a real expectation that what it takes to do SROI. Um, and so that's very useful to know uh, for, for the practitioner. And, and by the way, Timothy or uh, Ben, any of you can take it as well. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> what it takes to adopt SROI. Um, I think I think there are different perspectives on these questions. Um, I can speak from I can speak from the investor and the social entrepreneur perspectives. Um, for the investor, um, so we so we adopt SROI because um, because we truly believe as um, so measuring impacts, adopting the principles uh, elaborated by Social Value Internationals allows investors to really add value to the companies they are investing in. Uh, it's a way to not only be accountable to, 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 to the stakeholders, the various stakeholders of both the investors and uh, the, the enterprise, but also it's a way to, uh, to really understand where the added value of the solution developed by the company is and, um, and how to steer the, steer the company so as to maximize impact. Um, the different the different questions, the different steps that you adopt, that you go through uh, when while doing an SROI are really enlightening many aspects critical for identifying, for instance, a new revenue generating, uh, revenue stream potential, uh, ways of better communicating your message towards your stakeholder, therefore being able to reach better towards the, the people and the population you want to really reach at. Um, and, and, and various different other things. Um, so, as, as Ben mentioned earlier, I think there are different like levels to, um, of complexity in SROI. I think it's the, the beauty of this principle-based approach is that you can really take it, you can ad, uh, approach it from a lean perspective, really take it step by step. Um, um, really, it's not the point. I don't think it's important, at least from my experience, to try to measure it all and know what are all the positive and negative outcomes for all the stakeholders at once. I think, especially in the context of um, startups and scale-ups that have like a limited amount of resources and that really need to um, to be agile. I think I think being able to deep dive, focusing on, for instance, a couple of stakeholders first, looking at what are the most material, the most important outcomes for them. And then, and then gradually building up the impact model over time as the resources grow, I think makes, makes a lot of sense. And that's, I think, one reason why SRY is really applicable and really relevant for a practice as well. Um, yeah, Ben, I will let you add on that if you have anything to, to share. No, no I, think, I think that's great. Uh, thanks, Timothy. Um, Omash, you, you mentioned that. Um, 
you know, social return investment hinges largely on having a good theory of change. Um, and I would completely uh, support that um, theory of change means understanding what to measure. Um, and if you haven't understood uh, the what, as the IMP call it, um, then you could be monetizing or, or doing a lot of quantitative measurement around the wrong thing. So yes, um, I always say sort of uh, the, the, the art to doing good SRI analysis and, and good impact measurement management is to focus on actually what are the outcomes that are worth measuring. Um, uh, so yeah, just wanted to build on that really. Question for um, Timothy, if I may. Uh, how, how do you um, uh, encourage your investors to build uh, up that level of rigor? You, you say that the principles allow for that proportionate approach. Have you, have you developed that over, over the years in terms of saying, well, year one, can you do to this level? And, and, and how do you ramp that up over time? Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, our experience has teached us that it's not because you are a social entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur that measuring impact is an obvious thing, ob obvious thing to do. Like there are many, many social enterprises that do not consider impact measurement and something critical for running the organization. And while I'm happy to see indeed in the response of the audience that uh, oh, like measuring impact is important because we owe it to stakeholders. Um, I think that argument, while it's obviously the foundation, is it's in our case not sufficient to convince um, social entrepreneurs to put resources uh, both in terms of time and commitment of, of their team and money to pay sometimes for consultants to really um, to really take those steps. And so what we've learned from practice is that our, the way we communicate the importance of measuring impact and, and the way we uh, can convince entrepreneurs to start adopting the uh, SVI principles and, and measuring their ROI, we need to we need to adjust our language so so that it 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 sounds good in the ears of whom we want to convince and in this in our case we're not talking to a csr department we're talking to the ceo ceos of um, scale up social businesses and ceos what they need to hear from us what we learned is we, they need to hear that any any resource allocation leads to greater re uh, value for the company uh, be it in terms of a better reputation that can uh, help secure new partnerships, be it in terms of new revenues that can be created, be it in terms of efficiency gains. And so um, our, our quest and then like what we've tried to build up over the past uh, years is proved like the business case for measuring impact in a meaningful way. And so by, by pitching it in that way, we typically get closer or we get a buy-in from the CEO to really allocate resources to that. Um, so, so do, do um, CEOs of social purpose organization buy the argument? Do they see the business case for investing in impact measurement and management? So I guess um, it's hard to make a generalization in, for this, but I, I would say we have, for instance, um, we have conducted several impact measurements through our portfolio, and, um, and in many cases, we have been able to translate a specific element of the impact measurement. Let's say the first uh, one big part of SROI is looking at your stakeholders and understanding what are the different segments, what, what are the subgroups of stakeholders. Um, measuring, for instance, the outcomes and how important social outcomes are to specific stakeholders sometimes allows you to also identify different subgroups into your population and therefore segment your market better. Well, that, that, that example is a very like, easy one, but it's, uh, by showing those concrete examples based on our experience within, within the portfolio, I think we, can, yeah, we, we, we get a higher chance of convincing entrepreneurs to, to allocate resources to it. 
but but I, I must say it takes time. It's not an easy sell, um, and we we would really love because we are we're just an, we're an impact fund uh, with eight, uh, eight companies in the portfolio. Uh, we would really like to um, like to share more with other practitioners, other funds, other uh, uh, like even with SVI to see to identify like the different business cases for measuring the impact uh, because. Yeah, I think I think it's a critical it's a critical point to uh, push the practice forward, at least within the social business sector. I, I don't I don't think it's so might be less of relevance for nonprofits, but in the for profit world, this is a very critical thing. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I'd agree with you. Like putting impact measurement and measurement into concrete examples, like segmentation uh, is, is helpful to win the business case it's certainly certainly this shift uh, to using the word management uh, has helped uh, with us when we're advocating for these these principles because um if they are there to provide information that helps with management decisions people are more likely to um see the value of doing it and actually i i um have started sort of uh, conversations now saying you're actually all doing impact management um, because I've never met anybody who works for a social purpose organization who doesn't care a lot about improving uh, their, their organization. All social entrepreneurs are uh, constantly innovating and making decisions to uh, potentially improve their, their service or product. And so I say, take that culture and that mindset, and, and that is impact management, if you're making decisions to try and improve it. Now, how can we create a framework that allows you to make more decisions? And then I say this sort of principles give you that framework. And normally that um, gives people the confidence to go, oh, okay, I'm not starting from scratch. I'm actually already making a lot of um, uh, management decisions. But this framework here, if that helps me engage better with stakeholders and understand what is really valuable, then that can only be a really positive thing to embed in the organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I mean, this is a lively discussion. I want to really um, uh, switch gear to a little bit more practical use cases. Um, and so uh, I would like first to, for the team to do a first give a more perspective about what SI2 does today. And then uh, would like, like to also him talk about, um, uh, give, give an uh, actual example on how they are using SROI for scaling the business. And also the one interesting question that I have personally is that how do you ensure the financial proxy and what is the process that you use in uh, setting up some of the decisions you made with some of the social businesses? And you, you are welcome to share the name if you want to. If not, that's fine. You can keep it more general, uh, but I would love to have somebody walk you through the whole journey, how the process worked for you, uh, for some of the social enterprises. Yeah. Okay, let me briefly scan through the, the slides presenting SI2 Fund because I, I think that might illuminate what, how we approach the uh, measurement measurement of impact of our portfolio companies as well. I will I have a, a few slides on how we embed IMM, IMM in our investment process, so I'll, I'll come to that at the end. Um, so SI2 Fund basically um, a pioneer impact fund started started in 2013 uh, with a focus on the Benelux region region and adjacent country uh, with, a, with a, the drive and the mission to um, tackle the most pressing societal problems we have in society with um, solutions that are innovative, that are impactful, and that, are, that can be scaled and sustainable in the long run. So our mission is to support and help entrepreneurs have impact, address those problems in an effective way, but also build companies that can thrive over time. Um, so the next slide. It's a 17 million euro fund in, um, provided by a series of a group of families and um, found foundations. It's a closed ended fund of a period of 10, year, 10 years. And what we do is providing, we provide capital to social businesses in the scale up phase, typically from two, 250 to 1.5 million uh, for a period of seven to eight years. And we take minority stakes. The whole purpose not being to take control of companies, but rather to uh, be a, a partner of the founding team of the company and, and really have a have a, um, a skin in the game as well. 
Um, so if we if we look at the um, yeah, our mission and, and the way we communicate what we do, uh, we like to use the IMP framework um, to, to explain like in, in a few words, our approach to creating impact through our investments. Um, so we do, um, you might know this investor contribution framework with the six different strategies. Um, and so where SI2 fi fund finds itself is in the sixth, sixth strategy because we, provide flexible capital to early stage companies and social businesses that, that do operate in, in markets that might be under uh, capitalized. So where, where the, the flow of capital is insufficient today to, um, to really scale the solutions. We are a very active investor. So next to the money we provide, we're hands on uh, we have an hands-on investment team. We're going to sit every week with our entrepreneurs. We're going to help with uh, on different aspects like business management, impact management, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, this is a good slide. Uh, yeah, we're going to work on with the uh, with entrepreneurs on operation strategy. Uh, we're going to work on, uh, we're going to connect entrepreneurs with our networks. We're going to provide, uh, connect them with other investors, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, yeah, we, we work very closely with, with all entrepreneurs. And, and one thing that distinguishes us from a lot of impact investors is our impact management approach because we do not only embed like impacts within our contracting and, and, and our investments um, uh, in the investment objectives, but we do also really provide um, hands-on support to help the entrepreneurs adopt a very evidence-based approach to measuring impact, but also then um, steering the, the, the impact performance over time. We are board members and we require uh, or at least we expect um, on a quarterly basis to have discussions also not only on the financial side of the business, but also on the impact side of, of the business and, and being able to look at the different bottom lines to, um, yeah, to see that we optimize and maximize um, um, the three bottom lines. So this comes to yeah, what I said earlier, I think, but why measuring impacts? For us, it should not be a luxury, it should be a must have to properly conduct um, a social enterprise, to probably run a social enterprise. The traditional approach to measuring impact is very, is very top-down based. It's very investor push. Uh, investors have these, um, have these set of metrics that they would like the companies to measure, uh, often at output level. And it's purely, well, mainly from a reporting and compliance perspective. Our view is a bit more pragmatic. We, we'd like to, we obviously understand the value of doing that. And I think for the impact investing se sector, it's critical that we get to a base of a comparable impact da data so that we can allocate resources in a, a smarter way. But for our practice, we think it's very important to be more bottom up. So really look at st the, the specific outcomes of the stakeholders of each of our portfolio companies, try to measure uh, outcomes and um, and try to really spot, identify those pockets of value that can be tapped into um, at, um, at the end of, of the, the impact measurement. So how, how can that be, inform the management team of the company to, to take better business decision, decisions? Um, so your question, Unmesh, because I'm, I'm, this is SROI, why we do, we do it. Um, obviously, SROI is not the only method, and we are not advocating for adopting one method um, for anyone. I think uh, each method has its merits, and we do use SROI, but we also combine it with uh, storytelling. We also like to use uh, output KPIs. Um, it's it's very like uh, we don't think it's it's necessary to, to push any methodology on a company. So it, the methodology should be adopt, adapted to the specifics of a project or a company. Um, that being said, we, we do adopt SROI and why we do so, yeah, we can go to the next slide, I don't. So the advantage of SROI, we mentioned, it's grounded in theory of change thinking. It's obviously very valuable to, um, to really help the entrepreneurs frame their intention, intentions and think throughout the whole the different steps of the theory of change and then, and then start measuring uh, testing that theory of change in practice by, by, by measuring results uh, with stakeholders. Um, it allows you to really listen and create like contacts and relationships with stakeholders because you need to interview them to know what's happening. 
uh, you look not only at the positive effects, but you also look at the negative effects. So it's not only looking at the intention, but also at the unintended impacts, uh, which is very valuable. Many entrepreneurs forget that hell is paved with good intentions and that you can have the best intentions in the world, but uh, there are probably some negative things happening as well on the roads. And it's good to be aware of that, maybe measure it and, and manage it. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would say that's this, yeah, that, that slide is how we embed uh, impact measurement into our investment process. Um, we, I, I will quickly go through it. So, um, in the very, very first phase, when we meet entrepreneurs, um, we're gonna, we're not gonna measure anything. We would like to see entrepreneurs come up, come with their theory of change, with their impact measurement framework. But in most cases, that doesn't happen. As I said in the beginning, uh, it's it's not mainstream for social entrepreneurs to measure their impact. So we need we need to still bring that education and and aware, like raise awareness about why it's important. Um, but we're gonna test, like we're gonna look throughout due diligence at the different the five impact dimensions designed by the impact management project, and then try to already formulate an idea of what outcomes, what are the most material outcomes for the most material stakeholders. Um, we're gonna do that either by interviewing stakeholders, having calls, or by inviting a group of experts. It can be the management team combined with a, an academic uh, who has a lot of knowledge, who has a lot of knowledge in the sector. Um, can be, yeah, uh, an association dealing with the stakeholders, etc. Um, in order to have a first like idea forecast of where what the social value of a company can be it's not yet a measurement that can be assured or anything it's really a rough idea of where we're going and, and do we feel confident that we can pro that we can proceed with the investments that we think we can achieve impact so uh, we go to the contracting the contracting there will be some milestones defined we we try to integrate impact milestones as well so if you want to raise more capital with us as us, you will need to achieve those um, outcomes, uh, those levels of outcomes with those stakeholders. It's something we track um, and it's important to, to really keep the entrepreneurs in incentivized to maximize impact. Obviously it's a sensitive thing to do because you need to steer different bottom lines and you need to make sure that one mile milestone indicator does not, um, does not pervasively affect the other one. So it's a, it's a difficult exercise. But um, so once we once we agree on the investment contract and we go forward, we, we with our team we're gonna uh, really support the entrepreneurs with um, uh, forecasting their impact over the next um, next couple of years. We're gonna do that either with the help of a consultant. Sometimes we just send our the the entrepreneurs team to a training to an SVI training, and they're gonna and they're gonna work out their plan for. Their forecasts, but also their measurement plans with, uh, for, for testing the assumptions. And we're going to uh, support them with that. The important thing as well to mention is assurance of evaluation. So obviously, all, like, it's, it's important to have the impact framework reviewed by external party, parties sometimes, to have an independent person coming in and, and really asking the tough questions, checking the way outcomes are being measured. Are the outcomes the most important ones for stakeholders? Are you not missing anything critical? And so we do, we try to have every two years for each of our portfolio companies, a, a report assured by SVI um, to make sure that we, yeah, also to, to communicate in a um, transparent and more reliable way to our, towards our own, our own investors uh, within the fund. So I'm speaking a lot here, but um, this is this is in short uh, the process um, how we embed embed impact within our within our portfolio. And obviously, uh, as as shareholders of the companies, we're gonna we're gonna be working with the entrepreneurs in the board meetings, but also in separate ad hoc meetings on how we can uh, how we can increase the business value by. Um, by leveraging the insights that from the impact measurements. So that's um, also a very important thing that we, we are working on. All right. This is an excellent um, uh, walkthrough of um, your internal uh, thought process on why you do uh, 
and this is also addresses some of the question, but I, I want to also, uh, as, as promised, I want to give enough uh, attention to, I want to make it very collaborative and want to make sure that we address uh, audience questions. I'm going to start with some in the chat first. Uh, and uh, Ben, you can look at one, uh, which is in a Q&A, which is a little bit longer. Uh, the two of the questions are for Timothy. So uh, Ben, you can read that, but I'm going to ask uh, you the low ball question, which is a very important question. SRO is said to be very time consuming process. Uh, and I agree to some extent, um, but uh, there are values to that as well. But and I think as, we, as Timothy called out, and so is this is it a reality? Well, it is a reality where many organizations are using it, but do you have simple examples? Um, I think, what, what would you like to say about that, um, uh, Ben, our team? <clears throat> I can um, perhaps say that one. Uh, I get asked this quite a lot. Um, how long does it take to do an SROI? Is it quite time consuming? The answer is, how long is a piece of string? Uh, it depends how, how um, rigorous you need to conduct an SRI. And, and this is the beauty of the approach. We say, um, apply the principles um, which is proportionate to your resources. Uh, well, more to the point, proportionate to the level of decision making that you need. We use a very uh, catchy phrase in training, enough precision for the decision. I think Timothy's heard that one before. If you worked with Adam, he, he always says, so you need enough precision and confidence in the data to support whatever decision you're making. So if you your decision is to invest in an enterprise um, and the investment is significant amount of money, say a million euros, a million dollars, then the precision will need to be high and the social return investment analysis should take a long time to do. But at the same time, um, there might be uh, decisions with uh, less significance that you're making about how to improve uh, your service and in which case the principles don't need to be applied to the same level of rigor so we say that it's a flexible approach um, and and sri doesn't have a, a fixed uh, way of being applied um, it can take a long time but it can also be, the principles can also be applied in a, in a shorter uh, sense if that if, if that makes sense yeah i i do entirely uh, subscribe to what you said ben and uh, yeah, I, I would say two points. Like, I think scoping of the project is key. Um, so in the beginning of, of each like um, deep dive into the impact of an organization, it's very important to really define the scope in the perspective of what, what kind of decisions you need to take indeed. So it's very fine to start with um, a couple of stakeholders, a couple of outcomes uh, and, and gradually build up um, Build up the measurement over time. Also important to mention, many many enterprises are already evidence based before even measuring their impacts. So they have a lot of stakeholder data. They have they have those interviews in place. So also a way to make SRY more lean is to um, is to is to start from what exists. Is to start looking at what data do we have today that we can leverage to inform the impact of the company. And. Uh, a point worth mentioning as well here, because we're okay. This, this webinar is hosted by um, SOPACT. I think technology has a big role to play as well. Um, the most time-consuming part of an SRI is the stakeholder collection, the data collection phase, where you have to go out and talk with everyone. The more efficient, the leaner you can do this, and technology can help with that. The better, I think, the the, the more scalable your solution can be. And so. That's also why we, as with SA2 funds, do have adopted, like, have used SOPACT for, uh, for one of our investments because it's, it's a very, like, a very efficient way of turning raw da stakeholder data into uh, outcome metrics and a dashboard to analyze, like, the evolutions. So, yeah, um, those are mm -hmm. important points. And finally, uh, SR, like, measuring impact can be seen as a cost, and it is a cost, but it should also be seen in terms of the benefits, and that's why. I make again the link with my initial point. If you can prove there is a value in, to, in doing it, then the costs the costs is not like a net cost anymore. It can become a net benefit. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we have a 10 minutes and we have a six questions to go through it and see whether we can try to squeeze most of them. We might go a couple of minutes above if you want to, uh, anybody who's very 
excited they can stick around. Um, uh, we are aware of the time limit, so hope if you find this topic very interesting, uh, please stick around. Um, are welcome to obviously drop after an hour or so. But uh, maybe Tim, um, uh, sorry, Ben, uh, maybe you're reading the first question from Timur Scrave. I don't know how to say his name. Uh, maybe you can read the question uh, unless you want me to read it. Uh, it's a long question, obviously. So are, are you reading the same question? I obviously have tons of questions. That's the one. I see um, quite a few questions are about um, the outcomes and uh, which which outcomes are the ones to measure? Um, and I'd just like to pick up on, on Tim's point, really, that um, he's absolutely right. The, the lengthy process um, in doing a good SRO by applying the principles is identifying the outcomes because the principle of involving accountability framework is about amplifying the voices of people, and stakeholders that are not often heard. So um, that's where the time consuming bit is. Uh, as Timothy said, having conversations, open conversations with questions that are uh, allowing people to reveal what are the most relevant outcomes to them. It's not, and the SVI approach is about understanding what is relevant and significant from a stakeholder's perspective. And it's interesting because that may be different to what is relevant to the organization. And this is where um, I, I sort of have a question for Tim about um, outcomes, because um, the SVI framework is very much about giving a voice, hearing from beneficiaries and stakeholders what the outcomes that matter to them are. How do you handle that, Timothy, if, if what you hear is slightly different to um, what your objectives as a, an investor are? Because this is uh, a lot of the challenge that a lot of investors have. They have they have goals, they have objectives, and they have outcomes, and yeah. they would encourage their investees to report against those. But what happens when there's a discrepancy? Yeah. So I think um, the first way of answering the question is um, from from the fund's perspective, from SI2 fund perspective, we haven't we haven't uh, plans or we don't have a specific metric metrics that we want to achieve for instance we don't want we don't have in our goals to save so many tons of co2 emissions or we don't have any to create any specific amount of employment for vulnerable groups or population we do have a promise to investors that our goal is to generate an sroi in excess of two across our portfolio so that ambition allows us when, well doesn't makes like doesn't put us in a in a corner if if the company does not actually achieve the metrics that we intended to it to be it can still create social value on other metrics and that can still be fine within our commitment i think that's that's a way to to respond to it the on the other side as i said we we help our entrepreneurs understand the impact and we often tell them what you think is happening is probably not 100 percent accurate there, there are probably unintended positive and negative outcomes uh, with your, that you have with your business. And we are very like open to and, and really looking forward to uh, help the entrepreneur capture those things because, um, because yeah, I mean, it's, it's often full of surprises. The top-down thinking of, often the top-down thinking is, is full of assumptions, biases, which if, if we can, if you talk with stakeholders, you can challenge and eventually get to a much better view of what are the real frustrations, what are the real sources of value of the intervention for them. And eventually, if you, if, if you know that, even if it was unintended, it can be a, ve a very strong way, I mean, source of innovations for, innovation for the company. It could be a source for like a way to create a new product, like a, the, a trigger for developing a new service, a product it can be a trigger for um, finding new uh, payers in the model or whatever. So yeah, I guess we're, we're, we're not afraid of identifying unintended things. Um, uh, sorry, Ben, go ahead. No, no, I was just, um, I think that's really encouraging because um, it's, a, it's quite a, a unique approach. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I like the flexibility that that offers. Um, 
you as an investor to kind of support positive change without being too prescriptive about what the outcomes are and recognizing that we live in a world which is messy and unpredictable. And actually, if, if an investment is creating value in another way with different outcomes to what was intended, that's okay. You know, I think, I think I like that approach. It's great to hear. Uh, here's uh, my favorite topic for Timothy. Uh, this is from Juliana uh, Karavid. Um, I'm not sure I'm saying the last name very well, but do you allocate the money for the funds to help startups and entrepreneurs to measure the impact? Yes. Um, part of the uh, share of the capital we invest in a company is dedicated to uh, setting up a reliable impact measurement system. Um, so it's it's part of it's part of the investment. It's part of the contract as well. Uh, the entrepreneurs know that one of the post closing obligations is to set up an impact measurement system in place within the next six months, um, and a specific budget is uh, foreseen for that. And that budget serves the purpose of um, yeah, we we're paying any consultants um, identified to do the job. It can be to cover the, the software costs uh, for for uh, collecting and analyze, analyzing the stakeholder data. Um, yeah, so or, or or sending people of a team to the training, uh, a training of SVI. So yeah, that's it's indeed part of our investment. And from my experience, um, uh, I've seen I've not, not seen any investor who's been as thorough as uh, Timothy or as I to fund all together. So I can attest to that one. Um, now, next question. Uh, and the next question is from Bharataram. Uh, do you find correlation between social impact and business excellence? Do we find a correlation, a, a positive correlation? Yeah. Between social impact and business excellence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, depends on the model. But for instance, with SI2 Fund, we do we do focus our efforts on those interventions and business models where wherein the impact components and the sources of social value are really intrinsically embedded within the business model. So as to to have that correlation in place. The more revenue, the more the more products or services you will sell, uh, presumably the more impact you'll create. Um, we we typically refrain from investing in companies where those two aspects are really disconnected from each other, where there's actually a trade-off. Either you make revenue or profits or you make impact, but the one is not supportive of the other. And so, um, so yeah, we have, if you look at our portfolio, I think, um, I think 90% of the companies have a model where, where both, um, both the revenue and impact are positively correlated. Um, yeah. I don't know if uh, next question, do you know if uh, your fund or other funds are open to investing in steward ownership companies? Does the governance play the role in the review process and the steward ownership seems to be a great strategy to ensure the mission stays with company and no matter who the owners are? This, this message is from Cyrus. Is this, is this question about um, exits, like post investments, how impact is preserved in the governance after investing? Or uh, let's see if the Cyrus is still on call. We can have her talk about it. Uh, one second. I don't see her right now, but um, we can tag this question for this. Uh, next, move to the next one. As an imp a first funder, how does SI2 funds handle the situation where social innovators TOC doesn't focus on the most strategic cause of a particular issue? Right, that's a, that's an interesting one. Uh, and I guess uh, it's also something Ben can respond because I, I think one of the, one of the aspects of of measuring impact using the SRY approach is that you will very much focus your questions on how much value you create for a specific stakeholder. Does that mean that that value reflects how important it is for society? Not per se. It can be like the 
I think from what I think, I think the uh, SROI won't necessarily lead you to identify outcomes that are top priority for the world. Like it, it can be disconnected from each other. And so, and so while, while we start and we consider any investment from the perspective, starting with looking at the problems and like the, the root cause of the problem and, and the consequences of it, um, if the solution is found to not address that problem very well, I guess we as impact investors will, um, we will reconsider uh, continuing investing in the company or not like we will we might start looking for an exit opportunity for the company uh, sell, sell sell our stake if we find there's a complete misalignment between the initial big like the pressing problem we we hadn't identified a type of solution that we we support that being said we haven't had any case like that today so so far so I, I can't talk from practice uh, it's more like a theoretical assumption but maybe Ben you can complement what, what I've been saying here yeah, and I, th I think um, if I understand the, the question correctly, it, it goes back to what we were just talking about a few moments ago, which is about alignment between the outcomes that um, an investor is prioritizing or things are the most strategic and the outcomes that an enterprise might be recognizing in reality and practice. And sometimes those, there is a discrepancy. Um, and in that situation, uh, it, it takes an honest conversation between investor and investee to say, look, we thought that this was the theory of change, but actually having spoken to stakeholders, we realize this is actually what's happening. And is the alternative theory of change a positive one and one still worth investing in? Yes, great, continue. If not, then decisions have to be made. Maybe we scale back, maybe we stop the activity completely because um, resources could be more effectively applied elsewhere. So yeah, that's I, that's I think I hope uh, an answer to that question. Um, I have to be uh, apologize and say that I have a train to catch now, so I'm going to have to drop off the the, the call. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, I, I would I love this topic. I would carry on talking about this for a lot longer. If you have any further questions, um, I'd be happy to sort of answer. Um, on a forum uh, going forward. Um, so yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ben, uh, for the, your time. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you so much, and uh, really appreciate. It. We'll see you in uh, both Timothy and I will see you in a Social Value International conference in Taiwan. So, uh, those of who are interested in this topic, uh, please join Social Value International Taiwan conference. Uh, I, I would uh, like. There are still quite a few people uh, online. So Ben, if you want to. Uh, log off, that's fine. But Timothy, if you can stay, maybe there are a lot of questions for you. So if you can uh, go a little bit longer and uh, address some of the questions that people have for you. So uh, do your social entrepreneurs develop their own DOC or is it part of your due diligence process? Who develops uh, the DOC? Yeah. So the theory of change is um, is typically is typically elaborated in full terms during the due diligence. So we have a, during the due diligence, we have a workshop with the entrepreneur to walk through the change they intend to bring for the key stakeholders. And, and yeah, an outcome of our due diligence is, is to have a theory of change in place with a view on the outcomes, the forecasted outcomes, and uh, the, the, the metrics that we could use to, to measure those outcomes post-investment. Oh, uh, post closing. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, another quick question. I think you've kind of addressed it. But what are the typical size of projects in U.S. dollars? Yeah, so we are, size of investments, I suppose. Yeah, so the investment ticket, the average investment ticket is uh, 800k uh, in euros. Um, we can go up to 1.5 million. Uh, we start at 250k. Um, the typical size of the company. It's a company that has um has passed the market validation phase so they have they have a revenue they have revenues in excess of let's say one or 200k they have um yeah they have a stable sources of revenues and uh, they are ready for accelerating this the, the, the scaling of the the company they're not pivoting every week anymore it's it's yeah the step beyond after that Great. 
Uh, next one, uh, Tim, uh, can you give, uh, please give us an example of you uh, using existing investment companies on how SRO impact on generating new revenue stream and increased revenue? Uh, I think it's kind of a lot of things that have been discussed before, but maybe have you seen some example of uh, increased revenue because of yeah. the use of SRO? Yeah. yeah, so a very, very practical example. We have a company called Justice for Two. Uh, they're building a platform helping uh, divorcing couples do divorce in a more healthy and less negative way. So in order to protect, for instance, the children from parents being in conflict or angry at each other. So they have a platform with a lot of advice, a step-by-step -step approach to, to help, him, help them empower them and help them settle their agreements together, like without the involvement of a Law of two lawyers that will fight each other and stuff. Anyways, uh, one of the impact questions that we had in, for that company was um, an, an, a contribution question, like a contribution meaning like who else could have contributed to the change? It's, a, it's one of the last step of the SROI approach, one of the last questions that you ask. And when asking that question, we identified that more than 50% of the clients actually, actually called psychologists during the divorce pro process to help them out with the mental stress they were experiencing. So um, that was a big thing, like 50% of the client population using the, the platform, but also externally calling for psychologists for, uh, for helping them out with mental stress. So that insight actually uh, pushed the entrepreneur, the, the, the founding team of, of Justice for Two to set up um, or to design, uh, integrate in the platform, a way for people to connect with reliable peer-reviewed psychologists um, to get access to their services. Um, it's basically an, an extra little source of income, a commission-based income, but that they've, they've been able to add that to their product based on the insights from measuring additionality. That's one example. Uh, we, I, I noticed that we are still 10 minutes about the time and there's still half of the people you are still hanging out, so that means you are still interested in this uh, very deep and interesting topic and learning more about this from Tim. So we'll continue as long as you find this uh, um, information useful. Uh, next question is from Juliana. Uh, after exits, which uh, which is the which approach is SI to use to follow the imp impact of the projects? I'm sorry, can you? There was a bad connection. After exits, which is which approach do you use to how do you follow up with the, the projects that has been ex after the exit? Oh, do you yeah. Any follow up process for the new exits? Yeah, so if, if we sell our, our stake or shares in a company, we don't have anything to say anymore. That's, that's just how the world works. Um, what we do to prevent um, scaling companies that eventually do, do drift from their initial mission completely after we've exited the company and maybe after they have attracted a new larger investor on board, is to first ensure that we invest in what I said earlier, uh, in, like companies with an integrated impact business model. So where truly it's, it's impossible, well, it's, it's very hard to scale the company and its revenues uh, without scaling the impact. Looking for a positive cor correlation from day one, from the moment you invest, is actually also a way to prevent uh, mission drift uh, after you've sold your stake and after you, um, yeah, you you quit the company, so that that's a prevention mechanism. It doesn't like it's not perfect, but it's already something. Um, and I guess when we look for an exit partner, uh, a comp uh, an investor that could bring the company to the next stage, we obviously, obviously, as as often the main investor, look for partners in whom we trust that um, they won't sack uh, the. the like they won't sack the core model. Like they won't, they won't, they don't buy that company to put it down or pour, to change completing the model just to use its technology, for instance. We really make sure that in the, in the terms of the exit conditions, uh, preserving also the, the, the core model and, and, and the sources of current revenues and impact are preserved. But that's, yeah, we can only influence that to the extent we have a negotiate, negotiation power. It depends on in what situation the company is at moment of exit. If it's in a very good shape, very attractive, I guess, more negotiation power. If it's a company like a cell where 
um, there are reasons to negotiate heavily on the valuation. For instance, I guess we can. Yeah, we have less as investor. We have less power to to um, yeah to to embed impact protection terms in the contract. I agree. Uh, so I think uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I still see lots of people hanging out, but I'm gonna ask last question. Uh, if, uh, and I really appreciate all of you to be listening so uh, attentively, even after 15 minutes after the call. So, uh, and uh, so with that, I'm gonna wrap up this thing. But this is very exciting. And uh, let me ask you the last question: Do either of you utilize outside data sources to support the organization's impact? I assume when working with the startups um, uh, and early adopters, there is no data to support their mission. I, I think it's more in your case, you your business is how to cultivate those data, I, I suspect, right? I mean, and so um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that you are really, and since your businesses are quite unique, I even doubt that there are any external sources available for you to even benchmark altogether. Yeah, I mean, the whole, so on, on the data sets, yes, we do look at the common data sets uh, because I think it's it's our duty as impact investors to make sure that we gradually build uh, a data layer that is that allows for benchmarking, comparison and stuff. That being said, um, that's not the main purpose of why we're doing it. So we, we'd rather prefer to really uh, talk with the stakeholders of an organization, listen to what outcomes what outcomes are really important to them, and then find the best metrics for measuring that, that that could be inspired from a data set. It's often not inspired from a data set. It can be from literature. It can be from um, simply critical thinking uh, within the expert group, how we could best capture that. Um, but, but yeah, so it's so com aggregation and comparability is a noble cause. It's, it's something we should try for, but it's not our day-to-day -day priority. We, yeah, we, we are more pragmatic in the way we approach impact measurements with our portfolio. Excellent. So with that, uh, uh, I would like to say uh, we will, um, we are really appreciating your attentiveness, uh, all of you to join here. Um, we uh, would love to invite you to the another exciting topic we're coming up on December 17, which is about uh, the getting ready for 2020 for impact uh, in, uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, this is really about Iris Plus impact management project and how to use SDG impact. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very strategy and very important topic that most people in impact investing ecosystem are uh, really trying to figure it out. So hope you will join that with that. I really appreciate Timothy for spending his time um, in uh, uh, Guatemala and really answering all the questions and giving you much, much deeper insights to the everyone in the in the in the call. So, Timothy, would you like to uh, say a closing statement? Well, yeah, I would say um, I think we should have more conversations like this. I think um, if we don't want the impact investing sector to grow. Um, uh, to grow and explode like a bubble, <laughs> I would, I would, I would really think we need to have more deep, deep dives into why and how we approach impact measurements in in, uh, in impact investing. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad to to be able to contribute to this discussion today. Thanks for inviting me, and to all the participants who are still online, I really invite you. If you have any more question or or comments, uh, I'm really uh, happy to uh, to hear them. Um, you can reach out on LinkedIn or uh, or via email. Um, but thanks for your attention. Thank you, everyone. And on behalf of uh, SOPAC team and the, um, uh, the everyone who joined today, so I really appreciate and thank you for your time and stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.